Our scripture reading today is going to come from Romans 8, uh, verses 18 through 27, and that's on page 118. I consider that our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed in us. The creation waits in eager expectation for the sons of God to be revealed. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning as in the pains of childbirth right up to the present time. Not only so, but we ourselves, who have the first fruits of the the Spirit, uh, groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what he already has? But if we hope for what we do not yet have, we wait for it patiently. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groans that words cannot express. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints in accordance with the will of God. This is the word of God. Wait, this is the word of the Lord. I was like... (laughs) And then the traditional response is, thanks be to God. Right. Yeah. How many of you have ever uh, switched jobs in your lifetime and put in like two weeks notice at the previous job that you're leaving? I've, yeah, I think probably most of us have been in that situation at one time or another. Uh, I have changed jobs roughly every four years my entire life, and so I've done it many times. And uh, uh, one of the last times I did it was when I left my job in Washington State and moved down here for a job with Seminole County. And I I remember, like, the the job, I I liked my job up there. I didn't hate it. It wasn't, you know, I wasn't anxious to leave it. We were coming down here more just because we wanted to move back to Florida rather than any issue that I was having there. But still having said that, like once you put in your two weeks notice at a job, it is like this huge weight is just lifted off of your shoulders. Because suddenly you have like no more uh, responsibilities. No more, you're, you're no longer dependent upon that job. You know you have a new job that is coming. And so you don't, uh, you're not dependent on this old job for your salary or your health insurance or any of that stuff anymore. And if you're there at all and you're still doing your job, if you decided to give them two weeks notice, it's simply out of your own sort of personal integrity and uh, wanting to be kind to the people that you used to work with or work for and not leave them in the lurch by, you know, giving them a chance to find someone to replace you. And so two weeks notice you go in and uh, man, you're just, your step is a little lighter, you know, and you're, you're a little more cheerful and you just do the things that kind of need to be done and that you want to do because you know uh, you're not really obligated to be there. You could have just left, you know? And so I remember when I was leaving, um, obviously I still wanted to do a good job because there was a community safety issue. I was a probation officer and uh, also because of my partners and people that I worked with. But I remember that up there we had, every, we had these quarterly evaluations and at these quarterly evaluations the management would always make you lay out goals for the next quarter. And like it had to be like a, a professional goal and an educational goal and a personal goal, like all these categories. And of course, your goal for the next quarter could never just be like, hey, I'm going to do my job. You know, it always had to be something extra, you know. So I remember like one time my goal was, was something like, uh, I'm going to work with the state's attorney's office to streamline the paperwork when we do arrests or, you know, something like that. And it was always a fairly big burden on us because, you know, we were busy. We had enough to do already, and so we always had to do these extra projects. And I remember when I was leaving, I was way behind on my extra project, and I, but I was like, but I'm done. Two weeks, it's done. I'm not even going to do it. I'm not going to worry about it. Uh, I'm just done. And so then uh, on my last day there, well, first you've got to realize that people that don't live in Florida really have no conception of where anything is in Florida. So when people found out I was moving to Florida, everyone took to calling me Miami Vice. And so... So my last day there, I, uh, I, I co-opted the PA system, you know, through the phones in the office. 
And I, I turned it on and then I blared as loud as I could the theme song from Miami Vice through the whole building, you know, on the last day that I was there. So, uh, <clears throat> Katie, maybe we can get that for the next service, huh? And we can... <clears throat> So, uh, so that was my two weeks notice. I'm talking about this because I think it fits a little bit with kind of the point that Paul is making and has been making as we've been going through uh, this series on Romans chapters 6, 7, and 8. Um, we uh, have been talking a lot about freedom. And usually it's not just freedom from something, but it's also freedom for something. So we talked about how we are free from sin so that we can live for righteousness. We are <clears throat> free from death so that we can have a new life. We are free from the law so that we can live by the Spirit. And living by the Spirit is one of the things that we're talking about today as we go through this next section in Romans uh, chapter 8. Um, and it's a little bit like putting in your two weeks notice, we discover. Because when you first become a Christian, uh, or you first come to realize that, I know many of us have grown up Christian, but there's usually a time in your life when it kind of hits you, you know, what that really means, and how it's really impacted your life. And when that first happens, uh, you're really excited, and you realize, I've been freed from sin, I've been freed from the law, and it's kind of like this world that we live in, where we've been living under the law, where we've been living in sin, where we're plagued by illness and death and destruction and all of those things, it's kind of like we've put in our two weeks' notice. And this no longer uh, has any power over us. It no longer has uh, any authority over us. Last week we learned that there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. We are freed from all of that, even though we may still have to be here for a time. And so this is what Paul is talking about today. He's talking about how we live here for that time. And what we get already Uh, what we still have to deal with, and what we're hoping for in the future. Let's be absolutely clear, even though we hope for things in the future, Paul lets us know that there are things we get, there are benefits we get, there are blessings and changes we receive right now. In fact, he refers to them as, uh, he uses this term called first fruits. He says, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit. First fruits is from an old uh, Jewish religious festival where at harvest time they would take the first fruits, the first bits of the harvest, and they would offer them to God. And they would do this out of thanks for what he was giving them, but also in expectation that all the rest of the harvest was going to follow. So the first fruits were just the first little bit of much more that was coming. And Paul says that for us living here, living now, we have the first fruits of the Spirit. We have a little bit of what we're going to get, but we always know that there is much more coming. And so he begins to talk about the things that we have when we live life in the Spirit, when we experience those first fruits. We know that Jesus died on the cross for our sins and rose from the dead so that we could have new life. And we have that forgiveness right now. It's not something we're waiting for. Right now, in fact, the moment that Jesus died on the cross, we had forgiveness for all the sins we have ever committed and all the sins we ever will commit. That is something that we have right now. We have right now a restored relationship with God. Having been previously cut off from him by our sins, we now can approach him. And rather having to be afraid of a wrathful, angry God, we get a loving and graceful God. And then Paul goes on and he describes more things. He says in the same, this is in verse 26, if you want to follow along with me, we're going to be going, you know, through little things here. He says, in the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. The Spirit helps us as we live this life. That's a benefit we get right now. You know, I find it um, somewhat true that a lot of times Christians have a good understanding 
of how we initially come to salvation, that we have a good understanding that Jesus did everything for us, that we could not save ourselves, and that therefore he had to die on the cross and he gives it to us freely, and we get that. But then we think that, okay, then now as I'm gonna live the rest of my life, now it's up to me to do what is right and to follow him. And Paul reminds us here that we still do not do it apart from God. We still do not do it on our own, and that's a blessing because otherwise we still have some weaknesses, but here he promises us the Spirit is with us to help us. When you are struggling with things in your life, when you are dealing with issues and problems in your life, the Spirit is there to help you. That is one of the things that we get now. Galatians chapter 5 describes a little bit what this looks like for us when it talks about the fruit of the Spirit. It says the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. If we are talking about life in the Spirit, this is what it looks like for us. And these are the ways that it helps us by giving us joy when we would other, otherwise be sad and upset, by giving us peace when we would otherwise feel in stress and turmoil, by enabling us to live with kindness and goodness and faithfulness. And then in, chapter, in verse 27, Paul says, and he who searches our hearts, so in other words, God, so God who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. See, he tells us also that when God looks at us, when God searches our hearts, he sees there his spirit. He sees there the spirit of Christ. And so he sees us through that lens. The spirit intercedes on our behalf, and God sees the spirit of holiness and righteousness living in us. This is one of the benefits we have now, a restored relationship with God. We have these things now, change now, blessings now, through what Jesus Christ has done for us and through the life we live in the Spirit. But it is still a sad truth that the world we live in is not perfect. We still look around us and we see pain and we see suffering and we see war and we see violence and we see crime and we see sickness and we see decay. And we sometimes even look at ourselves and we see those things. Sometimes we get so excited when we first realize what it is Jesus has done for us and the wonderful blessings we have, but then as we begin to live our life, we see that, ah, I'm still plagued by the same sins and the same temptations that I had before. I still see weakness around me. You know, my friend got cancer, and I prayed for them, and they weren't healed. I still see suffering. I still see problems in my own life. You know, going back to the story about the two weeks' notice, when I first came down here to the job that I wanted to have, uh, the place that I wanted to be, and I got here and you're, I was all excited at first, and I felt pretty good about myself because, you know, if I may say so, when I was up in Washington State, I was considered to be a pretty good officer, kind of an up-and-comer, you know, a guy with a promising future. So I came down here feeling pretty good about myself, ready to roll in, you know, to county probation, County probation, kind of a little bit of a step down from state probation, you know. It's this misdemeanor instead of felony, and I thought, it's going to be a cakewalk. It's going to be easy. I was a superstar up there in Washington State, you know. So I came down here, and I went from having a caseload of 40 people to a caseload of about 400 people. And, uh, and organizational skills have never been my strong point. And, you know, I went from knowing everything about the system to having to relearn a whole new system. I went from knowing all the people I worked with to not knowing any of the people I worked with. And uh, I went from being kind of a superstar to the new guy that didn't even know what he was doing, you know? And uh, it, was, 
it bummed me out. I was actually pretty upset. And I remember at this time that it just really stands out that uh, when I was up in Washington State, uh, well, you guys, uh, may, I'm not sure if I've told you this before, but I'm a little bit of a fan of music from the 70s. And so when I was up in Washington State, I had this mixed CD of classic disco hits, right? And I would listen to it all the time up there. I loved it, you know? And uh, it was disco, by and large, kind of a feel-good music, you know? So I, uh, one day, I was, when I was down here and I was feeling bummed out, I threw in the CD to listen to, and I had listened to it so much in Washington State, when I put it in down here, all it did was make me think of being back up there again and everything I had left behind and how this new situation I was in was nothing like that before, and it made me actually even more depressed. And so I remember actually texting my wife and saying to her, uh, <clears throat> never has disco music made me feel so sad. <laughs> this is sometimes what a, a, a stage people go through in their faith. When you get that first initial high of realizing what Jesus has done for you, but then you begin to look around at the world around you and you go, Where, you know, where's the victory here? Where's the change that I was looking for and hoping for? You know, I can tell you that one thing that is somewhat unique about our Christian faith as opposed to other religions is that uh, we do not shy away from admitting that. We do not shy away from admitting the fact that there are still problems in this world, that there are still problems in our life. If you look at that passage that we just read, now granted it's kind of mixed in with a bunch of other stuff, but Paul names a lot of things that are going wrong. He refers to our present suffering. He says the creation waits with the implication that it's impatient. He says the creation itself, the world itself is frustrated with everything that's going on. He says that creation groans and we groan because we want all this to be better. We want all this to be changed. He admits those things. But then he says something that I think is kind of cool. After talking about the salvation that we have through Jesus Christ, our adoption as sons and daughters, and the redemption of our bodies, he says this, For in this hope we were saved, but hope that is seen is no hope at all. Who hopes for what they already have? You see, even in the issues and problems that we face today, Paul finds a silver lining, that it gives us something to hope for, that this is not all there is. So he's not just saying, hey, I mean, you got the Spirit and everything else you're just going to have to deal with. He's saying you've got the Spirit, but that's only just the first fruits. There is more to come. You have hope for the future. Um, you guys know I'm a big fan of movies. I talk about them a lot, so I'm going to talk about one today. And uh, I'm also a big fan of the superhero Batman. And so in the last Batman movie, is a movie called The Dark Knight Rises. It's been out for like two years, so I mean, I don't want to hear any complaints if I'm giving everything away here. But in that movie, there's a, a villain and uh, his name is Bane, and at one point he captures uh, Batman, and he brings him to this prison, like in somewhere in South America or something like that. And the, the prison is an underground prison, and in the center of it there's this huge open pit, maybe like a thousand feet straight up, 50 yards across. And it, you know, it's, it's like sort of paved in brick and rocks and stuff like that. And there's no barbed wire at the top, no cage, no guards, no alarm, no nothing. And uh, in explaining to Batman about this prison and why he's him, brought him there, uh, Bane says, the people here have hope because they think they can just climb out. And he said, uh, and he made this statement, which, just stay with me for a second. He says, this is the worst prison in the world because they have hope. And he says, because you can't truly have despair unless you also have hope. Now, I'll tell you that ultimately, I like that movie. It's a really good movie. There's a lot of good things about it. And I like even that character of Bane. He's a great movie villain. 
But the more I thought about that, the more I realized that's probably the stupidest thing I've ever heard. In fact, if you look at real life stories of survival, it is exactly the opposite. If you look at people that have been, you know, like through a plane crash in a remote area or in a natural disaster, or even people that really were in some prison somewhere, like the people in the concentration camps in World War II in Germany, it's the people that had hope for the future that had the strength to go on. It's the people that had hope that were able to persevere and to survive through that horrible experience. The people who despaired were the ones without hope, and they very rarely made it. Hope gives you the strength to go on. Hope gives you a reason to know that there is something better coming. But unlike someone that's waiting for a rescue, we know that the hope that we have is absolutely assured. In Hebrews 6, it says, talking about the salvation we have through Jesus Christ, it says, we have this hope as an anchor for the soul, firm and secure. Because the work has already been done. Jesus already died to forgive our sins. He already rose to defeat death, and we are just waiting to receive the full benefits of it. Paul says that we wait for the... Uh, for us to be revealed as the sons of God. And don't get hung up on sons. It was a patriarchal society, but it means all of us. That's right. Children of God. We are going to be revealed as the children of God, not just spiritually, but physically. He says we await our adoption and the redemption of our bodies, even these frail physical bodies that we live in that are prone to illness, that are prone to temptation and all of those things, will one day be completely healed and made anew. Even creation itself, the world we live in, he says will be liberated from its bondage to decay. No more death, no more pain, no more suffering. You see, the wonderful thing about what God has done for us is that he doesn't leave us hanging. He gives us things now that can help us through this life. He gives us forgiveness and a restored relationship and his spirit to live within us. But that's not all. We still are waiting for something even better. The job that I had down here, I ended up loving it. I ended up loving the people I worked with, having a good time. I'm still friends with some of them. God had a plan for me and was working towards something and he brought me there. And he has a plan for us too and for the world. A plan to save us through the power of his son, to help us live life by the power of his spirit and to one day redeem everything. So when you are going through things in your life now, when you are battling issues, when you are battling temptations, when you are dealing with failed relationships or illness, Remember that God gives you things now that can help you through that, but that there is more coming, and one day you won't have to deal with it at all. So in Jesus' name, amen.